you, fellas. Got your Bibles with you this evening. Would you open them to the book of 1 Peter? Stand with me as we read from the book of 1 Peter. We'll read from chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. We will begin reading at verse 18. Servants, be subject to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the froward or the perverse master that it's speaking about. For this is thankworthy, if a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully. For what glory is it if when you be buffeted for your faults, you shall take it patiently? But if when you do well and suffer for it, you take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. For he even hereunto were you called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, who when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sins, should live under righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. For ye were as sheep going astray, but are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your soul. Leave your Bibles open and may God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Bow your heads for a moment. Thank you, Lord, for your word. And we pray that you will speak to us from it tonight. And for that, we'll be grateful. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Peter wrote these words of our scripture reading, the institution of slavery was an accepted part of life, not just in the, well the Muslim world didn't even exist at that time, but throughout the world slavery was commonplace and it was accepted. I didn't say it was right or that Christians agreed with it. But it was an accepted part of life. Slavery was an especially hard concept for Jews to swallow. They thought because they were the seed of Abraham that they ought not to be the servants of anybody. But when the Romans dominated Israel, well, they found out differently. Society in those days, in many places, was divided into households, which included various degrees of servants, verse 18 says, ranging from slaves to perhaps even actual employees. Some of the masters of those households were good and gentle, kind and considerate people. While others, he says, were froward or perverse, meaning they were not the kind of guy you wanted to be your master. Very unjust. But regardless of the master's disposition, Peter was saying there that a Christian servant was to be obedient and submissive to them with all fear or respect. And truth was that many of the early Christians were either slaves or employees somehow of, of masters of, of some sort. Verse 19 makes it clear that Christian servants were to be motivated by the desire to be faithful to God's requirements and loyal to their superiors. They didn't just obey because they were afraid they'd be punished, 
They were supposed to obey because it was the right thing to do. He said in verse 19 that if a servant should happen to have to endure grief from some kind of suffering that he underwent wrongfully, Peter says that is an acceptable conduct for you as a Christian to endure it. Verse 20 says, What glory is there in taking it patiently if you're buffeted for your faults? But if when you do well and suffer for it, you take it patiently, that is acceptable with God, he says. Now Peter's not doing anything there other than echoing the teachings he heard Jesus teach on the Sermon on the Mount. And then he cites Jesus as the perfect example of how we should live. We're supposed to follow in his steps. All this stuff he's talking about, you, it just smells of Jesus. I mean, that, that's Jesus. Verse 21 says, When Jesus was treated wrongfully, Peter says in verse 22, that he did no sin. Neither was any guile found in his mouth. Guile is deceitful talk. Talk bad about somebody or talk back to somebody. When Jesus was reviled, verse 23 says that he reviled not. When he was verbally abused, he didn't give it back to his abusers. In other words, when he suffered, he didn't threaten his abusers, but instead it says he committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. <clears throat> Jesus was the perfect example. Anybody disagree with that? He was perfect. The perfect example. And he practiced what he preached. That's how I want to live. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure I always live up to that standard yet, but with his help, that's what I'm shooting for. What he's talking about right there. If I learn to take abuse, or if I learn to take suffering, or, or persecution, unfair treatment, go through sickness, whatever you want to put in there, if I can learn to take it patiently, committing myself into God's care, then I will indeed find favor with God and I will indeed be living and following Jesus' example. But if I don't, well, how can God be pleased with me? That brings me to the thought that my sermon title conveys. What happens to me is not near as important as how I react to it. For my reaction, and if you get anything, make sure you get this thought, for my reaction to what happens to me reveals my true character. Now very few people want to accept that, but that is true. What happens to you, good, bad, or whatever, will reveal what kind of a person you are. It will reveal your character. Character is what we really are. D.L. Moody said character is what we are in the dark. What he was meaning by that was how we act at home especially tells us a whole lot more about our character than how we act at church does. You know lots of folks that uh, they act quite different at church and at home they can be real characters at home. Horace Greeley wrote in poem form fame is a vapor popularity an accident Riches take wings, only one thing endures, character. 
C.S. Lewis wrote, Surely what a man does, surely what a man does when he is taken off guard is the best evidence of what sort of man he is. If there are rats in the cellar, you are most likely to see them if you go in very suddenly. But the suddenness, Lewis says, does not create the rats. It only prevents them from hiding. In the same way, the suddenness of the provocation does not make me ill-tempered. It only shows me what an ill-tempered man I really am. How right C.S. Lewis was. Character is not made in a crisis. It is only exhibited. We really don't know what our character, and others don't know what your character is like until you open the door and there are the rats. And you find out. Former UCLA basketball coach John Wooden said, be more concerned with your character than with your reputation. Your character is what you really are, while your reputation is merely what others think you are. Philip Brooks wrote, Character may be manifested in the great moments, but it is made in the small ones. Again, what happens to us is not near as important in life as how we react to it is. Mm -hmm. For our reactions show what our character is really like. Our reactions show us what we really are like. Melvin Newland shared this real-life illustration in a sermon that I read that he preached one time. He said it was true, and I, I believe it. He said, after church, there he stood in the midst of the Golden Corral restaurant with Thousand Island dressing dripping from his hair over his glasses, down his face, all over his jacket, all over his pants and his shoes. I'm not talking about a little bit of Thousand Island dressing. I'm talking about two gallons of it. Wow. <laughs> what had happened was the waitress that was carrying a two-gallon container of Thousand Island dressing for the salad bar had paused for a second while coming through the swinging doors of the kitchen, and somehow the two doors had caught her and knocked her forward, launching two gallons of dressing all over this guy. Well, he went ballistic. He started shouting, he started cursing at her, you're so stupid. I can't believe you did such a stupid thing. This is a brand new suit I got on. It cost me $300. His wife chimed in, Yeah, you ruined my husband's $300 suit. It's the first chance he had to wear it. He screamed, I want to see the manager. Thoroughly shaken, the waitress went to get the manager, and the manager come out. Now picture this. Here's a guy with two gallon of Thousand Island dressing dripping from him, and the manager asks, is there a problem? <laughs> <laughs> the guy replies, is there a problem? She ruined my $300 suit. It's brand new and I want a new suit. Manager says, we'll be glad to get your suit clean, sir. Accidents do happen and we're sorry for this one. Oh, no, no, he said. I don't want my suit clean. I want a brand new suit. 
and I demand a check for $300 right here and now. Well, to avoid a bigger scene, the manager goes back into his office, writes out a check for $300, brings it to him, and justice is served. Tragically, that story happened at noon on a Sunday. Why would somebody be wearing a new suit to the Golden Corral on Sunday at noon? Do you suppose he might have just been to church somewhere? <laughs> Do you suppose he might have just heard a sermon on love your neighbor as yourself? Or do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Maybe it was go the second mile. Could it even have been a sermon from our scripture this evening? Here until were you called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. Who when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not. But committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. Do you suppose that guy with the thousand, with thousand island dressing dripping off of his new suit, do you suppose he convinced anybody in that restaurant that day to follow him to church next Sunday? <laughs> I don't know if that guy had any bumper stickers on his car I remember my father-in-law used to have a bumper sticker on his car years ago that read follow me to church next Sunday and then there it was Confluence Church of the Nazarene you know, if you're going to put a bumper sticker on your car like that, then you'd better act right at the Golden Corral after church. Amen. Amen. Again, what happens to us is not near as important as how we react to it. For our reaction reveals our real character, our true character. If we want people to see Jesus in us, then we had better react to the things that happen to us in the same way that Jesus would react. Don't con yourself. Don't try to convince yourself that people are going to see Jesus in you if you don't react to the things that happen to you in the same way that Jesus reacted. How can they see Jesus in you if you don't do that? I mean, that's the way it has to be. I uh, don't think that would be wise. Otherwise, all they're going to do is brand you as another one of a long line of hypocrites that they have encountered along the road of life. And there's plenty of those, isn't there? Say one thing and do another when push comes to shove, especially. Now, as you all know, a lot of things have been happening to me physically in the, in the last few years. Up until a few years ago, if I talk, took two Tylenol in a month, I thought that was a lot for me. I never took any kind of medicine or never had much wrong with me or anything like that. But that sure has changed recently. And you know it'll soon be four years now that I've been dealing just with cancer alone. I really didn't know how to act when you got sick. 
and you've got something wrong with you. Uh, it, it never really had happened to me. But I've been consciously really trying to put forward the proper example as I deal with this stuff. Because you see, the goal of every Christian should be you want people to see Jesus in you. Amen. Amen. I mean, and that's what I want people to see. As a matter of fact, I've been trying to care more about that than I have been about caring what happens to me even. Whatever happens to me, okay. Uh, I win either way. To live is Christ, to die is gain. Amen. But I've been caring more about what people see as they, as they look at me than I have been caring about what's happening to me. I made my mind up. I don't want to feel sorry for myself. Nah, that's dead end history. <laughs> yep. I haven't been asking God, why is this happening to me? Like so many people do. <clears throat> or any of that. I'll get all my questions answered when I get to heaven someday, if I still have them then, or even care. Amen. That's right. And I sure don't want to be found worrying about my future. Although the devil sure tries to make a good case for doing that in my mind every once in a while. Uh, but I'm not listening because I know the old boy's a liar. And I've been trying my best to commit myself and my future and everything that's been happening to me to him that judgeth righteously. That's what Jesus did. There's safety there. There's reassurance there. There's strength to go on there when you commit yourself to Him that judgeth righteously. I've said it many times in the last couple weeks to people who have asked me about how I've been doing. They'll you know, say, man, you, you look good. You know, I can't believe you've had this happen to you. You look good. And uh, what are you going to do? Or how are you acting? Or what's, what's going on? And they really look at me funny when they see me up at the gym. <laughs> yeah. It's like, what in the world are you doing in here? <laughs> you know, and, and I, I just keep telling people, I've told you this before, the safest place you can be in this world is in the center of God's will for your life. Amen. Being in the center of God's will doesn't just mean living where you're living. Being here in Orbisonia and Rock Hill or, or being in the center of God's will doesn't just mean doing what you're doing for a living and you, you believe that's what God wants you to do or, or, or any of that kind of stuff. 1 Thessalonians 4.3 says, For this is the will of God, even your sanctification. And if I am enjoying the fruits of sanctification in my life, then my reactions to problems, setbacks, People treating me wrongly, sickness, problems, whatever you want to put in there, whatever kind of stuff you want to include in that list, my reactions to that stuff needs to be like how Jesus would react to it if I am enjoying the fruits of sanctification in my life. Did Jesus get mad? 
I mean, there was some righteous anger over some things that it is okay to get angry over some things. Getting mad is different, though, than getting angry. Did Jesus worry? Do we ever have record of Jesus fretting over anything? Did he ever demand apologies? Or satisfaction? Did he ever stew over things that didn't go his way? Can you show me even one example anywhere in the Bible of Jesus ever becoming bitter? If he ever did any of that stuff, he sure did a good job of hiding it. But I don't believe he needed to hide it. I don't believe he ever did any of that junk. Verses 21 through 22 of our scripture says, We should follow his steps. He who did no sin. Never. Ever. What a fine example Jesus was to follow. If you've ever been disappointed with people, if you've ever been disappointed with preachers, disappointed with church, disappointed with spouses, if you've ever been disappointed with anybody, how could they act that way, or why did they treat me that way, get your eyes off of them and get it on Jesus. Amen. He will never disappoint you. You will always see in Jesus what you need to see. You will always find in Him what you need to find. What a fine example to follow Jesus was. If you follow His example, you'll never be disappointed. And if you follow His example, you'll never be ashamed of your actions either. I'm sorry to have to admit that my actions in the past have sometimes been worthy of shame. I'm glad tonight those actions are all under the shed blood of Jesus, never Amen. ever to be remembered again. Amen. But what happened to any of us in the past? is not near as important as what is going to happen in the future. <coughs> Who doesn't have things in their past that they ought to be ashamed of? Don't you sit there all pious. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, and you're included in that list. Amen. Amen. We've all fallen short, haven't we? Somewhere or other. Hopefully none of us are ever proud of that. But from here on in, with His help, He wants us to react in the things of life, to react to the things of life, in the same way that He would react. And not just that he would react, we know how he reacted. He wants us to react in the same way that he did react. He's not just blowing smoke. He showed us how to react. I mean, you gotta you gotta pay attention to somebody that says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing while these guys are nailing spikes in your hands. I mean, you've got to at least give him a hearing. Because you, you don't find many people like that running around. So you better give him a hearing. We've all fallen short. But we'll give our life to him with his help. Can't do it yourself. But with his help, he wants us from wherever we're at 
good thing is we can always start over at any point in life. We can always start over from where we're at. And we can even start over again if we need to. We can even start over again if we need to. <laughs> but he wants us, when we start over with his help, to react to things in the way that he would react. And boy, I'll tell you one thing, when we start doing that, then we're really preaching. Mm -hmm. That's why I want to react like he would want to react. That's why I'm more concerned about how I'm <coughs> reacting to what's happening to me than I am concerned about what's happening to me. Because, you know, it's one thing to stand up here and talk. But when you really start reacting like Jesus reacted, well then, then you're preaching. Then, uh, then people will pay attention. Well, they might not, that don't necessarily mean they'll all line up to follow you, but they'll at least say, man, something about that guy. He's a little different than uh, most of the people I know. And uh, isn't that really what we want people to say anyway? Uh, something different about them and our prayer is for them to get to the place where they'll say I wonder what it is I wonder what it is that makes him tick I wonder what it is that makes her act the way she acts and then there's your chance then you get to say it's not me it's Jesus living in me that helps me to live this way. Don't blow it. So many people, somebody will say, man, I, I've been watching you and I, I like the way you react and this and that, what have you. Oh, well, thank you. I, you know, I'm, I'm real proud of myself, you know. <laughs> you just blew it. <laughs> you blew it all right there. Uh, you let Jesus out of the equation. Mm -hmm. I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. I can't do all things through me, <laughs> through my power, through my initiative. I can do all things through Christ. And when we do what we need to do through Christ, then we're preaching. I hope you're preaching. Hope you're not like the guy with a thousand island dressing on his head. But you just remember. Now, I hope I'm not being a prophet up here and something like that's going to happen to somebody this week just, just to see how you're going to react. But I guarantee you, knowing how life is, I guarantee you that something is going to challenge you this week. Something is going to give you an opportunity to blow up and blow your stack and go off on somebody or something like that. It'll be there. Guarantee you. If it's not, look out for next week. It'll really be a coming. But how are you going to react? What are you going to do? What are you going to say? How are you going to react when somebody treats you unfairly? Somebody talks to you in a way that they ought not to talk to you. Uh, well, if you act like Jesus acted, Jesus will be proud of you. But, that's bar head. Make it your prayer. You're serious about this thing we call Christianity. Make it your prayer to be like the one who did no sin. Who reacted the way that he needed to react to everything that came his way. And he'll help you if you'll let him. Let's join together in a closing word of prayer.